Hello, welcome back to SuperCloud 4, Generative AI, this is The Focus. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE. We're here for our studio event that we got two great guests to unpack Generative AI, the role of compute and how AI is working together. Okay, big friend Joshi, founder and president and CTO. Thanks for coming on theCUBE, appreciate it. Joe Lindman is CEO of compute.ai. First of all, love the domain name. <laughs> so gotta, gotta love that right out of the gate. Good Thank to you. see you guys. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Joel, we've been on before on theCUBE, SuperCloud uh, 3, I believe you were on. I think it was a three, was it three? Yep. Three, about cloud scale, Just security. Just a few months ago. Mm -hmm. um, this is the focus of the gen of AI. The hype is off the charts and you're seeing kind of two schools of thought. You got the old school systems and entrepreneurs and thinkers who are all over this. So they see a whole nother complete paradigm shift around how computing distributed computing is going to be implemented with kind of the AI act angle. And then the next generation, kind of the young guns coming up, yeah. kind of like a generational shift, clearly a major inflection point. Some are saying uh, it's as big as the PC revolution, the web revolution, and then mobile. I think it's all three combined in my opinion. Uh, we we see this as a big wave. It's a generational thing, but it's also, it has the infrastructure side super important. Everyone's talking about the apps, but under the covers, whether it's platform engineering or cloud, the generative AI is going to be a big part of their narrative going forward. You guys are in the middle of it. We're going to get into the compute relationship to all this, but um, how do you see that app and infrastructure piece? Well, first of all, I'll talk to the hype cycle. Uh, you know, question that you posed. I think we're at the peak of the hype cycle, maybe even a little bit beyond the hype cycle, and we're going to go into the trough of disillusionment. But for those who have a vision that is focused and understand the impact, it's not there for no reason. We're going to have a wave for the next 10 years of implementing, adopting enterprise AI in ways that improve our productivity. And I think you know, the McKinsey study proves that we're going to have $4 trillion a year in extra economic productivity due to AI as we implement it, as we figure out what it even means. Vikram, as the founder, real quick, you know, what was the motivation? What was the vision around this? Because your background, first explain your background, they'll get into the, to the, to the, to the founding. Yeah, so I'm a system software engineer. I write code um, and an entrepreneur. So this is my fourth startup. And my past lives, prior to being an entrepreneur, I guess a good part of my life has been uh, doing companies and going after chasing big ideas and dreams. I started my career at Sun Microsystems. Um, was fortunate to have worked with some other founders. Um, back at Sun, brought up some early Sun machines to life. Later, Silicon Graphics, so played with 3D graphics <laughs> <laughs> before GPUs were born. So I changed domains rapidly, and then later Oracle, which is I think more pertinent and relevant to the conversation which is going to have, relational compute, databases, and had something to do with Exadata. So that's pretty much been my background. So you, we've seen the movie, you've seen the wave, you saw how the telecom in connectivity, compute power, mini computers to then that whole interconnect, the networking, distributed computing revolution. I mean, many ways of innovation. Joel, you guys, I mean, you've talked about the thoughts around liberation of compute from data warehouses. And right now, I mean, we've been covering big data from going back to the early days of the Cube 13 years ago, the Hadoop days. And, and the vision was great, but it just never happened. But yet data warehouses now move to the cloud. And now everyone says, move the compute to the data and you get the edge. But with AI, we see a whole nother power dynamic. It's almost as if AI is a gift that dropped into the market at this time that's going to change the landscape and liberate the market and specifically the role of compute from data and data management systems because all we hear about today is I want to do more AI but I need more GPUs and oh my God, the compute costs are off the charts. What's your thoughts on this liberation of separating compute from the database, data warehouse and the database management systems of old? Uh, great question. So first of all, you know, when we think about AI and the adoption in the enterprise, it is going to drive a thousand times more demand for complex compute. And, and that complex compute is going to be in the form of machine generated SQL. I mean, that's the lingua franca of uh, enterprise AI. That's what's proliferating everywhere. You can see it in business intelligence applications today, generating more and more complex SQL for compute. Um, so the so what that means is we need to get our data story together. You know, we need to come together and figure out how do we shore up our infrastructure? How do we drive a lot more efficiency out of our compute? And the first thing that needs to happen is we need to liberate it from our data warehouses. So just as storage was liberated from uh, compute, we need compute to be li liberated from our relational database applications. And once we do that, we're in a place where we can spread compute everywhere. And we're also in a position to go open. 
You know, the hyperscaler yeah. market boomed because of the cloud architecture. Vikram, this is interesting with data. It's almost as data has hit this new inflection point where generations of thinking mm -hmm. might have to be thrown out the window because AI works great with more data, mm -hmm. but data is also this where everyone, what everyone wants to steal. Right? right. That's the security challenge. And you got the distributed mm -hmm. computing challenge with latency. <laughs> Any database theory doesn't make sense if you start to think that way. But so how, what does it mean for people to think about this? This is a yeah. huge concept, oh, separating oh. Um, the compute Computer the data, from data manage management. Yeah, what, it, what is it, what does it mean? Yeah, yeah, I think I'm so glad that you put the spotlight on that. And, and just um, so that we get the, the lingo here and the terminology right, it's not about separation of storage from compute. That problem was solved, whether it was MapReduce or the oracles of the world, whether the SAN and the NAS independently you know, scaled um, storage from compute does not matter. This is about pulling compute out of databases, out of da data warehouses, liberating it, making it available like oxygen, like the ether that's ever present, omnipresent, whatever, omnipotent out there because data is everywhere. And if you look at the clouds, let's take EC, you know, AWS EC2, for example, is the entire compute layer. And then they have the storage layer. Every cloud has its own equal and parallel. The, able to, the, the ability to super recruit large numbers of cores and compute without having to think in terms of a database silo. I need to put my data into a table, into a database and a data warehouse to be able to type SQL. I think that's passe, that, those, that day has gone. Yeah. So we are upon, you know, a new future um, that looks very different. Even if you look at what's going on with the BI applications today, um, Tableau, Power BI, Looker, they generate at least 10x more SQL than all human generated SQL. What's the future? The future is more autonomous sources of SQL generation, more AI ML driven dashboards, uh, no one's going to sit out there and use yeah. their editing tools and say, let me type, do a little bit of ELT, you're going to throw 50,000 joints. Was that Dave Vellante who talked about the computer's not here for doing those 50,000 <laughs> joints? Well, let's talk yeah. about 100,000 or a million and yeah. make that cost effective. So semantic layer compute is going to go out, not to humans, but it's going to be AI ML driven yeah. and um, also the low code and the no code applications. So when we talk about AI ML, often the first thought that comes to our mind is, let me start to you know, use those GPUs and run some generative AI and LLM models. Uh, this, is, this is a bit different than that. This is the impact of AI at an application level that is now going to go out and touch into, it's, it's going to tap into these data stores, these semantic yeah. knowledge, and this universal you know, index of information to feed these applications all done in an autonomous and an AI ML fashion. And the compute for that is going to be, what, 1,000 times? It's anyone's guess, 10,000 times more than the SQL that we have today. And leave aside that <laughs> today's machinery is not even efficient for doing what we can do. You know, we, people are talking about data warehousing like, costs. So that's sort it's of like the, the caveman idea. invented the wheel. Now we got to move into the modern era with things. So what you're saying is, is interesting. It's that um, that's going to require. You mentioned lingua franca, SQL, large language models. These word language. So if SQL is the language, it's machine to machine talking. Mm -hmm. Exactly. If you will. So this is feels like a neural net meets large language models. Are we, are we looking at a different system? I mean, almost like an operating system for AI. It's like, if you take that forward, you have all this compute, what happens next? Because you can't run it on the old infrastructure or maybe you have to modify or abstract away the infrastructure. How should people think about this unlimited compute or dynamic compute or elastic compute? I mean, how do we, what do you call it? I mean, because if you have compute everywhere, it's oxygen. Yeah. <laughs> well, we like to call it abundant compute. <laughs> um, so, the, so the concept is, you know, you should be able to breathe it in. Your application should just have it available wherever it is needed. When we break down data silos, we also have to think about breaking down compute silos. It does us no good if we move the data everywhere. We have a data-centric enterprise, but our compute is still stuck in silos here, there, and the other dictated by the applications. We need to spread the love all over the data center. And you know, the way we do that is, is a technical question. And you're right to point it out, it requires a, reinventing the vertical stack from the very top to the very firmware that we're yeah. operating our hardware with. It sounds yeah. complicated. Simplify it for me. Mm -hmm. What is the bottom line? 
How would you describe it? Because it sounds too good to be true. It sounds like, right. because you're setting the table for data being addressable yeah. and secure. Well, I think um, this, is, this is not something new. I'm, I'm just going to roll back a little bit here. The separation, the concept of separating, pulling compute out of data management or databases has been present for quite some time. I mean, let's go back to the Ndiza days. Mm. What did they do? They took compute and they pushed it towards data, which was going to be mm -hmm. better for certain workloads rather than move terabytes of data towards compute, you take compute and move it towards data. Later, Exadata follows, you know, as inspired by Natiza and others. So playing with storage and compute separation, independently scaling them, the ability to take compute and move that around, these concepts have been present. A credit where it's due, the work which has been done by the Spark and the Presto mm -hmm. community especially, has actually done a lot of, has made a huge dent in the separation of um, the data management in the data layer. Uh, for example, if you look at the lake house, right? What is the lake house? Um, it's just a bunch of parquet files. <laughs> and your compute is just you type in SQL. Yeah. You don't think, you're not confined to a data warehouse. You're not confined to one of those silos. So I believe that the precedent is here. The problems that need to be solved have to do with compute efficiency um, and making it cost effective. Mm -hmm. And the final frontier, I think, for data warehouses and databases is uh, concurrency. Data, data warehouses and concurrency don't go together. So when you start to look at the new kinds of workloads and applications that are going to be coming out and hitting these databases, we're talking about this machine-generated SQL out here, it's going to be so much in quantity, right? We talked about many orders of magnitude more, and complexity too. A machine generates pretty damn complex SQL, right? And as the complexity, so complexity along with con concurrency exacerbates the whole problem. You want to make the compute for that efficient. And to, to set the stage for what's happening, let's take a, you know, like what's the state of the union today? If you look at the compute efficiency of data warehouses, databases mm -hmm. in general, um, today, especially for elastic compute, uh, we are using three out of 10 cores, right? That's a 30% CPU utilization, and maybe even that's a generous number, um, 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 especially if you start to look at elastic clusters. Mm -hmm. So we are leaving 70 cents on the dollar here behind mm -hmm. on the table, and obviously, if you hear about the cloud data warehouse compute costs, I talk to customers all, of the, yeah. all the time and say, help me here, yeah. you know, we love what we have, we like having 2,000 connectors, the cloud data problem has been solved, but my compute costs are very high. Yeah. And that's, and that, by the way, that's a validation for what we're hearing in the marketplace as well, cost is the bottleneck. Joel, that's a great point about the late house, I want to get your thoughts on this, because it's still a relatively new concept. Uh, it's clear data warehouse is on, it's on its last leg, it's an old, old way, not the new way, but it's still in, installed everywhere. What does a customer need to be aware of when considering migrating to say a lake house, where you can start tapping into setting an architecture up for uh, this kind of new compute separation? Yeah, well I think that you know the, the warehouse market has been uh, given a, a life extension uh, by some of the leading vendors and that life extension is from, uh, they made it very easy to use. So there's a single JDBC endpoint. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's in the cloud. It's easy to access. You don't need to hire a, a team of DevOps engineers. And it's absolutely reliable, 100%. You know, those are really compelling things for people in the enterprise who don't want to dip their toe in the lake, so to speak, or the lake house, <laughs> right? And when, you're, when we're talking to customers, um, many of them are saying, I want to build a lake house. I know I have to. The data is ephemeral. It's open format. I need to go there to solidify my infrastructure, to future-proof my infrastructure, but do I need to hire a team of DevOps engineers? You know, is it going to fail on me if I run out of memory? So these are problems that still haven't been solved. Mm -hmm. And you know, the giants in the industry are, are solving these problems right now. It's a really exciting thing to, say, to see. Yeah, and yeah, if I were to jump in and add to that, that's right on. The spirit is there. People want to go out open, they want to spell their tables in the data warehouses onto open parquet and iceberg or delta or whatever f formats. And then the general um, um, sort of thinking there is, I do want to go to an open standard, mm -hmm. an open dialect of SQL such as say Spark and Presto, right? 
and I don't want to have to deal with throwing DevOps engineers and other stuff, right? Yes. It's, it's like buying my Tesla along with the whole um, shop of technicians, right? I don't want to have yeah. to do that. And I think credit goes to um, the cloud data warehouse um, companies out there, the pioneers who made it super easy, that some single JDBC or SQL endpoint, I just look at that, I don't have a deal yeah. with that, and stuff mm -hmm. just happens. Yeah. When's that going to happen? And, and, and the second mm -hmm. other issue you touched upon at the risk of repetition here, John um, and Joel here, which is I have to provision for my worst case memory, right? Mm -hmm. Every once in a while, you know, the compressions and the rare factions of my workload require massive amounts of memory. Provisioning for the worst case means um, because, you know, a love for in memory systems, nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Stuff is supposed to run, but there's more data, there's more complexity, there's more concurrency, okay. and you're not going to be able to throw large amounts of memory at it, and the trade-offs are harsh. You yeah. start to page this memory to disk, right, spill to disk, and the performance is going to be slow. So provisioning for the worst case means lack of efficiency. So, so these are the kinds of issues that are the customers that we talk to. I want to just complete the thought there for you, <laughs> <laughs> or maybe right. add another point. Hey, awesome. Uh, you know, the data lake market is growing at twice the speed of the warehouse market. It's growing at 20% yeah. CAGR through 2028 is yeah. one estimate that I saw versus 10% CAGR. So lakes are already, lake houses, I should say, are already growing at, at twice that pace. Can you imagine the rate of adoption that we'd see if it was as easy to use as a cloud data warehouse? Yeah. Or, you know, as, as, as simple as connecting your single endpoint and, you, and it was as reliable. It was enterprise grade, ready to go off the yeah. shelf. It would be massive. No and out of memory failures, <laughs> right? No yeah. ohm kills. So well, that's well, a good point. Well, first of all, the word memory is interesting now because it comes up in two use cases. Memory as in physical memory, in memory for storing stuff. Right. And then memory from a recall perspective, retrieval is a big hot topic in generative AI. So I want to kind of connect that to the super cloud theme, which is, across environments, whether it's mm -hmm. pu two public clouds or on-premises edge, because you know, talk about comp moving compute. Right. The edge was really the, where the first conversation started around that conversation of moving to moving compute around. So we all know moving data is expensive. So when you look at data um, and its addressability, how do you look at the multi-environment piece? Where is it a semantic layer? Um, is it just one big data pool where you have the intelligence built in with AI now, with compute kind of programmed into it. I mean, I'm just kind of riffing on this, but like, how do you see this? Because I can see the benefits of data lakes over data warehouse, check. But also uh, the data warehouses in a public cloud are also constrained in their cloud. So the easy button here would be one big pool and managing multiple environments. What's your, <laughs> what's your, am I over the top here? <laughs> or am I fan, fantasizing too much here? Uh, no, I'm going to let Joel you know. address this. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, what, what decade am I in? That, yeah, 2055? That, um, that, that might be beyond my pay grade as well. Just that, be that one big you know, but I'll, be dead by I'll, I'll, I'll offer a thought, right? Um, so the, the big Fortune 500 companies that we've been in conversations with want to go hybrid. They want to go on-prem and cloud and multi-cloud. They want to have their cake and eat it too. Uh, when you start talking about federal contractors and military applications, they want edge devices. Yeah. Uh, they don't want to wait for their data to be centralized in yeah. some repository. There's security issues around that. And so, you know, fast forward here as we see the evolution of the super cloud, it's going to exist at the edge. It's going to exist in the fog. It's going to exist in the in the in the data center and the cloud itself, right? And um, our small piece of the of this party at Compute AI is driving compute efficiency in all of yeah. those places. It's really the interoperability between our pieces of hardware and making sure we get the most out of that CPU, yeah. the most out of our memory, and the most out of our applications all the way up the vertical stack. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Absolutely push the limits of um, CPU, memory utilization, dissipate mm -hmm. fewer watts. What would the world look like if we could dissipate 5x fewer watts? Yeah. You talked about the edge. We yeah. do talk to the, to the government and DOD and stuff like that. And um, on the edge, battery power is a huge issue, yeah. right? So you want to do federated compute, right? I mean, that's the model that even Google And real time, tactical edge, for example, with the uh, military is all about real time, having the data, low having latency, the data, battery. Someone's walking yeah. there with a battery pocket yep. pack, or there's a robot doing that. So compute efficiency is going to be very critical. And of course, GPUs are important. You're going to have to make those decisions out in the field 
without having to be able to tap it or even have a connection back to the central system. I mean, basically this comes down to the use case, to your point about the Tesla. I mean, you have to be optimized for the use case or the application. Mm -hmm. So here we come into the vertical versus horizontal. You want the scalability, but if you're on the edge, say military, yeah. you need to also talk back to the central data, but also maybe replicate data. It's all kinds of use case scenarios yeah. for that application. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. that may not be used by anybody else. Correct. So you need to have the compute. So this is, is this an advantage where separating the compute makes that better? Is that an example? Am I thinking the right way there? Oh, oh absolutely. Though I'd, I'd say that while there are, John, you point out, there are so many problems there to be solved. The one that we think is quite fundamental and um, maybe has the potential <laughs> of being the tide that lifts all boats yeah. is the one of compute efficiency. And when you look at compute efficiency, it's really compute and memory. They're yeah. two sides of the same coin, right? When the core to memory ratios um, haven't gotten any mm -hmm. better, they are actually getting worse, as, as we know. Processor speeds and memory speeds have stagnated for the last 15 years or so, mm -hmm. more than well over a decade, right? So things haven't got many yeah. faster, much faster. We are doping more transistors into processors, which means what do you do with these things? So yeah. you, either you're going to put more cores in there or you're going to put more caches. Yeah. And now with in-memory systems, with large amounts of transient ephemeral data, which is in passing, I need to hit that data really hard while, while it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's under my cores and while it's in the memory, all that is causing massive CPU stalls. So yeah. when Joel and I look at these systems and we see what, what is the root cause of, of the lack of CPU utilization? Why is it that we are seeing only 30% yeah. CPU utilization? And why is it that um, when you look at elastic clusters and distributed systems, the CPU utilization is even more? And when you put the economics of that back into the yeah. picture, for example, cloud costs, right? I mean, we know we are talking about the edge here too. The same thing almost applies to the edge. So if you look at cloud costs, they are directly a function yeah. of the amount of memory, which is the most expensive component of the whole sure. thing. And memory and CPU are literally two sides um, of the same coin. <laughs> <laughs> they mean money. If your CPUs are stalled, yeah. you're not yeah. doing work. And if your memory is not sufficient, you know, paging to disk, you're going to get IO weights, and that means less utilization. So Whether you're paging, just to complete the thought, sorry. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> Do interrupt me, though. So I just want to get the whole thought out here. So whether you're getting the data from a lower tier of storage, which is a spell to disk, right? In the past, we had to take a coffee break when you started to page, remember the Linux yeah. operating system? Or you're going to get that data from over the network. It's going to cost IO weight. Yeah, yeah. These are some of the issues yeah. having to do with uh, efficiency in compute, and aside from liberation sure, of compute. This so is the, where the action is, because uh, um, Dave and I were interviewing uh, one of the head guys that tell Jeff Clark, and the marketing people are like, don't we talk about solutions, not about speeds and feeds. <laughs> we're in a speeds and feed market right now. All the conversation is, <laughs> how fast can the silicon go? I need more chips, I need more power. We're in a renaissance Stop. of systems architecture on a global distributed Without basis scale. <laughs> and, and now with AI as the gift, that's going to give the hyperscalers more power. Really in a perfect storm opportunity, it means pre-game, it's not even first inning. This is where the opportunity is, had a heading. Where, where's compute AI fit in? What's the vision? Where are you, where are you taking the company? Because right now, you know, all the future scenarios put aside, people just want generative AI working. They want to be positioned to leverage the current situation with headroom so they don't foreclose the opportunities ahead of them. They don't want to misfire, so I won't say baby steps, I'll call it maybe kindergarten, maybe play with some blocks here, you know, get on the rug, you know, play with a generative AI. So people are experimenting. Yeah. They just got to get going. Where are, you, where are you taking compute AI? Well, compute AI is a fundamental building block for next generation architectures, and it really is providing the scale that is needed to address that extra workload that AI is going to bring, the thousand X workload that AI is going to bring. Um, if we don't fix our data infrastructure now, and by fix I mean making it compute efficient, making it infinitely concurrent and scalable, making it you know, appropriate to feed a machine that is just hungry and just eating and eating and eating all this processing power, if we don't fix that yeah. down to the very lowest level with CPU utilization, um, you know, then the costs are going to be out of control. Yeah. And I'll give you, let's bring it back down to earth costs for a huge. second, right? Our, our favorite, you know, leading, this is just one example, a cloud data warehouse company, right? If you add a ninth user, your cloud cost doubles. Your cluster size doubles on the back end in the cloud, right? Concurrency is Every eight. ninth user, right. so the yeah. concurrency of nine, yeah. right? Yeah. Or a concurrency yeah. of eight. 
we're talking about the need for a concurrency of thousands or hundreds of thousands of joins, as Ricker mentioned before. The concurrency is so. huge, and this is again, that's why it said this is so disruptive to the database world because yeah. the theory of databases was constrained to state of the art at that time. Yeah, yeah, so exactly. And and also, if you see, um, which is the reason why we've had oil TP style workloads, which is you know ATM style bank transactions, millions per second or whatever, and then you had warehousing, which was more data mining, which was DSS style workloads, and traditionally that has been, let me just run through billions of you know rows in a column, shred through them rapidly, that, that's what data mining was, let me do an aggregate and give you the yeah. average of mean, mean and median or more or whatever, yeah. right? From there, what has happened, and I think it's important that we talk about this, especially when we talk about you know, efficiency of compute and what does that really mean. When you look at the modern day workloads and the modern day complex compute, it's not exercising our columnar stores, even though the data is in parquet on, on disk. It comes into, if, you, if you're just talking open source language, it comes into memory as arrow format. That's still columnar, but the days of columnar, columnar databases, especially if you subject them to modern day workloads are gone because it's no longer columnar yeah. work. So let me give you an example. It's postmodern, it's old modern. It's now it's, it's we got to remodernize it, basically. <laughs> right, right. Then, you know, there, there, right. There's, a, there, there's a better, it's better. Super cloud them. <laughs> there you go. So, so, so what the pattern um, that we are seeing for some of the more modern compute, especially when, when it is generated through auto generated through one of these autonomous AI generated SQL sources is row column, row column. So you're going through large numbers of columns, doing aggregates, and now watch this. You, you take these aggregates and use them as join keys. For other columns, same or different tables. That's, that's super complex. You cannot now have the benefit of that linear compression that you get in memory. You have to go row column, row column, and yeah. that's where you have to over, over provision memory for the worst case, and that's where Ohm kills happen, yeah. that's where you run out of memory failures. Yeah. So this row column paradigm puts a huge burden on the memory infrastructure yeah. and yeah. as a result on the compute and now the same problem. So AI as a gift on one hand is also a challenge and this is where inflection points really kind of show. There's always going to be kind of a new way to kind of have some friction that you fix. Right. Yeah, and massive levels, of, massive levels of complexity is going to come in I mean, if you look at the you know, SQL generated by Tableau, unless it's stupidly simple select statements because my table was denormalized, yeah. you cannot keep denormalized summary tables. Maybe I'm taking you guys into the lead, <laughs> but generating simple we don't mind. select statements is, is not always possible yeah. because data changes, new tables come in, yeah. more joinery is needed, more group wise are needed. SQL stands for Structured Query Language. <laughs> I say language, LLMs, large language models. It could be the lingua franca. Final question in conclusion. First of all, great masterclass. I love, love the deep dives. Really good to get into because it shows where the action is. You kind of that's right. It's happening. You, you got to go into the deep into the into the stacks. So, okay, that's the problem. There's a few hard uh, problems. And it will be fixed. This is going to has to, and it will be because it, the opportunities are so great. Final question for you guys: What is the future vision of compute? Because I like this idea of separate, and that's concept we'll continue to talk about because it makes sense. But what's the future vision of compute? So uh, I'm sure you, you know, as our skipper. Um, you know, you have something to say, but but I didn't want to do another database company here. Don't want to be the tenth search engine and don't have something yeah. significant to offer. You know, think Google, right? So um, the whole um, challenge that's ahead for, of us, which is lack of infrastructure efficiency. Mm -hmm. We are throwing massive amounts of infrastructure, CPU, memory at the problem. Costs are higher as a result of that. There's an opportunity mm -hmm. there. Given the problem of AI, ML, autonomous sources uh, generation of SQL, which is huge amounts of SQL coming with high complexity and high concurrency. So solving those problems is uh, super exciting yeah, yeah. from a technical perspective. And we can see there is um, yeah. ample business opportunity here and value um, there are today's problems that need to be solved. Help me, my data yeah. warehouse costs are high. <laughs> well, how, what can I do to offload my compute? I'd love to go to the lake. Yeah. And yeah. So there is an opportunity yeah. here for us to address some of these customer pain points today and future proof these yeah. customers' needs for the future that I think is going to... Joel, it's a new paradigm. What's your, what's your thoughts? We'll close it out. So, um, 
Yeah, our mission is to make compute abundant and infinitely scalable. I kind of said that a couple of times, like like oxygen, like, oxygen, like, like <laughs> yeah. breathing, it's a dream right? Scenario. And well, the future is closer than you think. Um, you know what we're seeing in real world uh, workloads and situations is a 50x price performance improvement um, in in early use cases, yeah. um, and we're building on that. And I kind of alluded to this earlier, but if you can stick something into the environment that is very open that has a single endpoint, very easy to use and no DevOps requirements, that's where we're entering the market. So we're taking these data lake infrastructures and we're building upon, we're standing on the shoulders of giants and we're saying, maybe we can add a little bit here. We can make it easy to use, open, infinitely scalable and reinvent the wheel without even reinventing the wheel so that people can simply consume it. Well, if you can enable companies to build better, faster, generative AI apps, which is data driven, data is enable, it's native, sometimes, a bolt on, sometimes it's an abstraction, however you look at it, it will be critical. Yeah, I mean, early use cases are data transformations and pain points where the costs are high, but I can't tell you how many conversations we're having about AI and how do I operationalize this and how do I get it out of my, after I've trained it, how do I deploy it? Vikram, great to see you on this new venture and big idea, Joel, great, great company. Love the URL, compute.ai. Um, Let's get the backstory on how you got that amazing unit. So we don't have the Cube AI yet, so someone else got it, beat us to the punch. But thanks for coming on. John, Cloud. great Appreciate meeting it. today, yeah. and thank you for having us okay. over. Thank all right, you, bringing out all the action. Cloud 4, generative AI, the infrastructure, what it takes to make it happen, to enable developers and applications to be AI native with generative AI. That's what this focus is all about on Super Cloud 4. Thanks for watching. <laughs>